This video is called Talking Points, and that is because we want to talk to you. Now, most of the time, you're watching me or someone else on screen, but we don't actually get to have a conversation. So this is a bit of an in-between, and the idea here is we look back at some of our films, we pick out interesting points, or talking points, as we have called them, and then between us, we can have a little discussion. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you utilise the comments section, you will be able to answer my questions and talk back to us. There we go, that's the format, and we're going to look back at the month of November in this video and the videos that we released during that time. So, the first thing I want to talk about is from our film with Oz Holness in our Tired and Tested series, which was all about his use of the multi-rig, or what began as the multi-rig and has later turned into the multi-hinge, so a cross between the traditional hinge rig and a multi-rig with a stiff hook section, etc, etc. So, my question to you is, how many of you have caught a big carp on the multi-rig? Because Oz has caught loads, and in this clip, you're going to see a prime example, not just of him catching big carp on the rig, but everything that topography is about. People who love carp fishing, catching big carp, you know, very much in the moment this is, but what delivering information to people like you along the way. So this is the epitome of a topography film, a great section and one we will all look back on very fondly for many years to come. Sometimes you, you're just, you, you feel like everything's going according to plan, nothing can go any better. Well, third bite of the trip, first one of this morning, kept us waiting, fizzing over the spot. We watched them turn up, we called it, we had to wait till gone midday for the bite came. But classic, fizzed up on the spot, rods ripped off. We've got a lovely, beautifully plated mirror, lovely plummy hues to the head, a few battle scars there from spawning still. But yeah, really chuffed with this one. Really nice old carp. Right, let's get this one back. Well, thanks very much, mate. Let you uh, go back home and uh, see you again when you're older. So I don't use this version so much these days, but I'm gonna show you now how to tie the simplest and most easy version of the multi-rig. So take around 14 inches of your chosen preference in coated braid. In this instance, I'm using the stiff version. The first thing I now do is slide on a tungsten sinker. The next stage is to create a fold in the hook link, which will enable you to create a loop and the height of which dictates the height of your pop-up. So this is the loop we're creating now that will go through the hook. Now we simply trim the tag end. Next, create a loop at the other end of your rig, which dictates the length of the rig itself. I like to tie a slightly longer loop at this end, just giving you that nice stiff boom section that allows the rig to kick away nicely from your chosen leader. Once again, trim the tag end. We now need to create a break in the coating at the hook end to give us that hinge effect. Now slide the sinker to the end of the break. So what you're left with now is a nice, neat pop-up section we've created here. What I also like to do now is just loosen the fibres of the inner core of the braid, just twizzle the boom around, loosen those fibres up to create a really lovely, flexible joint. We then slide that loop through the eye of your chosen hook. In this case, I'm using a size four beak chod. We then simply thread a hook ring swivel straight over the loop. We then simply pull the loop over the bend of the hook, tucking it round the point to create our looped D section. All that's left to do now is set the height of the loop and the size of the D. So I like to take the top of my loop to around opposite the barb of the hook, form the D, and then I'll just steam that so everything's nice and uh, neat and straight. And that's created your perfect multi-rig hooking section.
Was your wife? Was your wife? Yeah, bloody hell, that was an aggressive take. Took a lot of line, it almost made it through the gap. Getting in that big weed bed now. Just keep it moving, should be all right. In my head, I sort of, I called it, I, I, I felt, I knew what fish this was. I got, I got visions of the Flint Common in my head. Especially with that aggressive, uh, first take Jim that probably took 35 yards of line it might have a bit of weed over its head now you never know though it can be so deceptive when they when they're absolutely saturated with oxygen after yesterday's performance you know even a 20 pound common can give you an absolute beast of a fight and it's kited round to a weed bed on the right hand side of the swim and as this happened, I've got a lot of line now out in the lake. It's obviously bowing out towards this weed bed at about, I don't know, 80, 90 yards. Just as a swan took off from the bay to my left. And I watched as this swan paddled across the water, flapping its wings and about to take off in full flight. It's come straight towards my line. I'm, I can see this absolute carnage happening. Oh no! Oh, you fucking arsehole. Do you see that? Fucking have me line. Jesus fucking Christ. That was a close fucking one. He's in that weed. Fucking hard fighting carp. I could just imagine it knocking the hook hold out or something, but. You know, I've got ultimate, ultimate faith in those rigs, the hooks that I use, and they held firm. And, uh, you know, a good battle with this uh, powerful old carp. And when it rolled for the first time, I think we saw this sort of, uh, this, this flank, and, and I actually thought it was a mirror to begin with. And then uh, I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's a common. And I saw the wits. No, it's a common. It is the flint common, isn't it? It is the Flint Common, isn't it? Fucking Flint Common! Fucking <laughs> yes! What did I say? I thought, I thought that aggressive, that, that, that raw power, that aggressiveness, surface fight. Yeah. I know it spawned out, but it's an aggressive old carp, isn't it? It's proper, proper red in history, this. That's what did you the swan! Did you see me lower the rod? And it still hit the line. I thought that could have, that could have pulled the hook out, but good old multi rigs. They don't fail you, do they? They don't let you down. Check that out, mate. That's a fucking unit. Shut up, look Oh. Mate, ship it. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if she's out here at the moment. Something I forgot to mention first time around is we're going to be giving away a hoodie to somebody within the comments section. So if you answer our questions, put your comments in there. We're going to pick someone, we're going to contact you, and we're going to send you one of our brand new topography hoodies. Just thought I'd point that out because I did forget to say it at the start. So the next thing I want to talk about is from a film called Underwater Trauma, which is in our Submerged series, which of course is our underwater film series. Now, we went to Junction 12 Carp Lake with Ian Russell. Ian is a guy that's been carp fishing for a very long time. He's fished quite literally all over the place and has caught big and small carp from everywhere he's ever been. He's one of those guys that just knows how to catch them. So we couldn't wait to do an underwater film with him. And... Reading and Districts, Junction 12 Lake was going to be the perfect setting, crystal clear, loads of big carp, you know, everything was set and ready. But if there's one thing that you cannot predict, or you can predict, but you certainly can't change, is the weather we get in this country. And we all know, or at least 
I would like to think a lot of you know how affected the carp can be by the weather. And if you weren't aware of that, then please take note of this because the weather is one of the biggest factors in carp fishing. It can quite literally change it and turn everything on its head in an instant, and it did in this case. We had really hot weather, 30 degrees throughout the whole week. But one wind we rarely get, especially in the summer, is an easterly. And when you get a fresh wind like that, that blows in a totally different direction, often the carp will move on it. Our camera was at sort of halfway down the lake, the easterly would blow straight past us and up the other end really. And we had everything set and ready. I'd been going down there, I'd been baiting up, you know, the spot was primed, the carp were visiting, and then we turn up to film, and on the first day, this easterly picks up, and the carp just vanished. You know, they really did. And what ended, up was, what ended up happening was the whole stock turned up on the end of the wind. They didn't stay there for long, but it was enough to kill the swim dead. And this little clip, you know, will really highlight exactly what happened. And my question to you is, how many of you have had your sessions either ruined by the wind or made good by the weather? You know, if you keep your eyes on it, if you're always on the lookout for changes in weather, you know, it will help you catch carp. And at the same time, if you don't do that, it's not going to help you at all. So how many of you have had your sessions affected, good or bad, by the wind? Every time we make an underwater film, the importance of the weather is highlighted and it's happening once again here. Last week when I looked at the weather, there was easterlies forecast and bright sunshine. Now an easterly wind is not a common wind, but it blows down into an area they call the polytunnels. And it's shallow down there, it's weedy down there, and these conditions are absolutely perfect for it. I knew there would be carp there, but I couldn't really find areas that were good for the camera, so we've stuck to where we are now. I baited it on the Wednesday, which was last week, that got smashed overnight. I then came back and baited again on the Thursday heavily. That's been smashed. You know, this spot was getting visited a lot a few days ago, but with this changing weather, the fish's habits changed too. And they are now stacked at the bottom end, on the wind, in the sun, tearing it up. We've never moved an underwater camera before, but we have lived to regret not moving one. And we did not want to make the same mistake again. With the numbers of fish that were down on the end of the wind, we just had to do it. In actual fact, we've ended up moving the camera twice. It wasn't easy to get it into position. The first spot that I tried to put it on, it looked good, it was quite flat, but once you started touching the bottom, you could really tell how much sediment was on it. And one thing you can guarantee that will happen is, you get the camera in position, fish turn up, start to feed, and then you lose clarity, which is no good. It doesn't matter how clear the water is, when the fish aren't feeding, you know, you need to make sure you've got that bit of clarity whilst they are. So we've had to move it to a second one a bit further down the bank. Now the second spot, is what I would call a rubbing spot. It's got a big piece of wood in the middle of it, it's cratered out around it, and what you end up with is essentially a hole, and it is clean gravel because it gets rubbed on. There is a bit of sediment, but in comparison to the other one, a much better spot. The only problem with that is, it's much harder to get the rig in position properly because of the perspective. If it goes too high, it's over the cusp of the spot, and out of shot, if it goes too low, it's right in front of the camera. So it's been a stressful day, but we're doing everything we can to get rigs in front of the camera. If it was a normal fishing situation, you wouldn't be sitting up the other end, you'd be moving straight down here. So we've tried to do that. And hopefully it pays off. It looks perfect. C come and have a look, mate, because it, it don't, look, don't look like your rig's on the bottom, mate. I can't work it out. It might be, but it just don't look right to me. Leave that there, because if, if that is on the bottom, it's absolutely perfect. Rig's in position, in fact it's been in about 20 different positions because when I got it perfect, threw an handful of tigers, threw an handful of corn, it didn't even make the bottom because what emerged was a shoal of uh, rud, about, they all look about a pound each on the screen, they're probably not, like piranhas. The corn never made the lake bed, the tigers did, the rig got moved about 55 times, I've lifted it in, out, in, out, so now I'm going to sit over there, we've had hardly anything to eat, light the barbie and hope the rud do one. Okay, it's five to six. Rod's been out mm, getting on for an hour. Yeah, I reckon it goes quicker than you well, think. Well, yeah. We've right. just seen our first two fish. So two fish have come through the shop. Yeah. The rudder have gone. <laughs> well, do you think they're, they're all full up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know. 
bizarre, I didn't know you mate. put a tin at half a tin of corner. None of it got to the. None tin. of it made the screen, mate. You know, they took it as it, it almost a foot under the surface. But there are tigers down there, and like like I say, we've just seen our first couple yeah. of fish. So. I mean, it does look a bit sparse there, doesn't it? To be fair, there are tigers. You know, if I was throwing them in four and five at a time, so there'll be some down here. There'll be some down there. The rud was there, so obviously as the tigers were going down, they're obviously getting knocked about as mm. well. So you know, it's what we've got is what we've got. Yeah. We've got a couple of hours of daylight left, and I'm, I'm going to bait this tonight. Probably, yeah. Ooh, that's a good he's, fish. Is he turning at us? No, he's, no, he's, he's got, away, he's he's got a mate with him, and all yeah, look. He turned away. Yeah. But yeah, good signs. Things are looking up. It good. might be the camera because they're not used to. No. I don't know. We're waiting to see, won't we? No, that was the first time I've done this. They're a long way away from that camera. Are they? Yeah, I yeah, don't think it's that. They're too, not close enough yet. Yeah. Okay. We'll see, we'll see. We'll see. But I will bait this tonight with Boilies, uh, last knockings, and we'll see what happens overnight. Yeah. Eh? Carp, carp, and it's coming straight at us. Look at that. And it's a good one. That's, that a, good is, that's a big fish, mate. Yeah. It's a, don't go. Don't <laughs> go. They keep having a look, though, mate, don't they? There's a few now. That's the... That's the biggest we've seen. I don't like these spots, the craters, the rubbing spots, but like it is the best spot we've got down at this end, so Hell, we make do. Salute you. You've been in that boat in what, three different spots checking out, and this is the best option, mate. I, I agree with you. It's rubbing the, spots aren't always feeding spots, yeah. but it's the best we've got, mate. Best you know? of a bad bunch. It is the best of a bad bunch. As soon as you moved in the other spots, you couldn't see anyone. It's no good to us, mate. That's really nice now, isn't it, Danny? Yeah. Coming yeah. on the spot, carp coming on the spot. He's coming in, he's dropping, he's dropping, he's dropping. He's, he's dropping. bloody, he's going, oh, look, he's look, look. It. Yes, yes, he's going to have it. Oh, my God. The sediment on the lens. He's moved it, he's moved it, mate. Wow. Oh, <laughs> come on. Yeah, had a little look, mate. Maybe you shouldn't critically balance that next time. That was... That was epic. Yeah. That was epic, mate. Right, after the close encounter, there's been a couple more mooch on past, and it did look a little sparse down there. So I've gone and got a bucket of my old complex tea, which is soaked in shrimp liquid, and some more tigers. So now I've dressed up the dance for a little bit more. Uh, the rig's still in place. It's leaning up against a little leaf on the lake bed where the fish moved it around a bit. The, the fins rushed her up. But um, it looks a lot more attractive down there now. Hopefully we'll get them in and get them dropping. Now, why did he veer? He always come at dinner time. He's, he, he's turned around now, he's gone back home. Sorry about the eating. But it is dinner on. Mm. Well, you've been bang at it all day, to be fair, mate. Moving swims, that is. Hungry. There's a few now. In the last 10 or 15 minutes, there's been four or five, got, you know, at that perimeter. Yeah. But to test my um, knowledge on rigs, we do need them to visit the baited area. So. And that'll be really getting lifted out in about 45 minutes, won't it? That. Right, next question. How many of you have been fishing abroad with your friends? Because the film we're going to look at next is quite literally the epitome of that. Now, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with Finn Lewis's Wild Man series, and most of the time it's him and his friends fishing together, but they make a little bit of a cameo appearance. You know, it's largely Finn, he might pop out of his mates. You know, it's, it's never been just about him, but this film is far from just about him because. Finn is joined by three other friends and they head out into Europe fishing. Now, the idea was to go and fish the canals, just have an adventure. The film is called Fun, Friends and Adventure for a reason. And that is because that is what it's about, you know. The fishing, as much as the fishing is a big aspect of the trip, you know, a lot of it is just about going away with your mates and having a laugh. And if none of you or some of you not, haven't done this, then I would advise you give it a go because I've done it myself a few times now, and it really is exciting. Going into Europe, you know, loading the van with you and a mate or a couple of mates, and going and experience something totally different to what we're used to here. And it's not always easy, and that's kind of the point I'm getting at here with this film, the section I want to show you. Like, they went away for the week. <laughs> there was no point where they were all catching, you know. It's, it's often not going to be like that. You're not going to be catching all the time. One of you might, but the, you know, the chances are the others won't, or at least, you know, it's going to be tough at times because you're exploring new places, you're going to places you don't know about. And if you're fishing the canals like they are in this video, you know, they're vast. 
the car could be anywhere at any time and you really have to put the effort in but if you stick with it it will come good in the end and I think that's the important message to, that this next clip will get across so yeah my question is have you ever been fishing abroad with your friends and how did you find it and maybe to add to that if you fancy the idea of doing it is there anything you would like to ask us that might help you you know be able to make that sort of dream come to reality as it did for these boys here so watch this clip it's really cool and like I say epitomizes the um the aim and the ultimate goal when you're going abroad is have fun, stick with it, and it will come good in the end. One thing you can rarely guarantee on a trip like this is that you're all going to catch. And in this instance, you hadn't. For a change, you were the only one to have caught. But what's that like when you're with a group and you know everyone wanted to catch a fish, but not everyone has? Well, it's mixed emotions, of course. I mean, it's weird because usually, I'm with John, I'm with Toby, and I'm with Tom, and if I'm totally honest, I would say each of them are far more experienced and better at carp angling than I am. I might be able to catch a roach a bit quicker than they would, or a pike, but when it comes to carp angling, them boys, I ask them, they don't ask me, you know? Um, so when I, when I caught mine, obviously everyone's elated, we're all there together, we're all, you know, everyone's sharing the moment. But then obviously it spreads the concern of everyone else wants to catch and it makes the feeling of wanting to catch heightened. And it just didn't happen. One, it didn't happen in a few different reasons. One of them, we kind of went when they were spawning. So when we was finding fish, they were funny, you know, not acting how we wanted them to, that you couldn't really get them to bite. I got lucky, I really did. As I said before, you, you just got to carry on grinding and working hard and persevere. That's one of your best friends is perseverance on a trip like that. And before you know it, it, it was going to come good for someone. All right, where are we going, fat boy? Right, we've got about six hours left of the trip now. We're headed to Rotterdam. We're going to catch a couple of carp there, hopefully. Uh, we know it's a good area. You go and get a couple of bites. Good area to head, head to on the way home. Fingers crossed. We'll see you there. <laughs> I love it round here. It's the second time I've seen a cormorant again eel. Look at that. Where's it gone? Oh look, it's got it again. It just swallowed it. Look, 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 it's done. Okay, so we have stopped off. It's been so much rushing around. It was literally rods out of the motor and get round here. I've seen fish as well, which is nice. We ain't got long, couple more hours and then it's our tunnel back home. And then it's the end of the trip. So, unless one of these rods go in a bit, one carp for the week. But like I said, yeah, like I said earlier last night, I think it's been so enjoyable. It's been the bollocks. And what else could you, what else could you want? I know more carp, but I, it's more than just that, innit? I'm out with my friends, I've had a lovely time, been in nature, you know, been sleeping rough, so it's been the best. It's really been the best. We've literally got an hour left until we have to be on, a, on our way to Calais. Some major bubbles going on down there, Tobes. We've seen some on this stretch. It's the next stretch up from where we was last time. Oh, it's just a lot of fucking pissing about again. But desperation makes a man do anything, doesn't it, Tobes? We'll keep it going until the very last knock-ins. But this mirror we just see in this one is a big one. We couldn't help ourselves, to be fair. Everyone's getting a rod out here for the last hour. We see a few big ones. If I zoom in, look. Toby's over there working. What? Toby's over there walking about with a worm. I've got a rod out here, a little pop up on here. And Tom's going to put a few tigers on his, I think. A bit of variation, not intentional, just the way it goes. As if the boy wouldn't have pulled it out of the bag at the last half hour of the trip. He went around there free lining a bottom bait boily, and he's had two coys. Nothing big, but well done to him. He's caught. We're going to go around and have a little ganders now, aren't we? I've 
forgot to say why we're celebrating for Toby. I lost one about 10, 15 minutes ago, a common, maybe a 20 pounder. But uh, it just tore through the weed, come up onto the surface and it faced me straight away. It shook its head and the hook just come spearing towards me. So never mind. I caught one the other day, it is what it is, can't catch them all. Gotta laugh if you don't cry. Oi, oi. Well done, miss. Nice. Whoa! Just leave that now. Last minute. Last minute, we pulled it out of the bag. Easy. One after the other. Two coin. Happy days, Tobes. How do you feel, Tobes? That, that's the fucking bollocks, isn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> Your first well, Belgium carpet is first, bright. It is a bit of a wrong one, but it's a bite. It's my first Belgium carpet, I ain't coming away. So. <laughs> it's actually pretty sick, bruv. I'm it's not gonna cool, lie. It? That's sick, man. Big ups. Well done, bruv. I'll right, get some pics and we'll send it on its way. It's like an orf, innit? I think that is. Yep, You'd thought, wouldn't you? <laughs> they hang around together. Nice. Go and send them back, boy. There we go. Right, next stop. Can't oh, make them feet are well nice. <laughs> Look at the state of their old feet you got there. Old milk bottle feet. <laughs> old milk bottle feet. Give it a good touch, though. <laughs> cool, look at that. Same colour as my feet. Same colour. Oh, same colour as your feet, Toby. Same colour as my feet. Belgian bangers, mate. Euro Banks 4.7. Right boys, we're going to leave this here because next thing we know we're on the ferry, aren't we? On the ferry? It's a uh, tunnel, you know what I mean? This is the end, mate. This is the end of the Belgian trip. Isn't it? That's it. Until next time. Until next time. Little dog. Shut up, badger heads. Stink and all, you see your kinder. You have only had one wash in four days, man. <laughs> <laughs> I had one wash. No, it's been one and a half. Unfortunately for three of you, you would all have to go home. But there was one man that was going to stay, and what happened quite literally moments after you left and there onwards was pretty special, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> it's exceptionally special, yeah. On that final morning, we all woke up in a, in, a, in a moment of despair, I'd say. Obviously, I, I'm still buzzing. I've caught one, but it was a few days previous. So you start thinking, oh, you want another one? But like I said, it's the last day, we've got a couple of hours and we're on the ferry back home. Well, me, Tom and Toby are. So we went and looked at a little canal on the way back, done our little bit. And I wouldn't even have said that we was on the ferry. And we got a pretty special phone call from John where he stayed on and he'd done his bit. Johnny boy, welcome to Sapography. Thank you. Your first appearance. So I've got a question for you before we go into the fishing. What did you find it like fishing with Finn for a few days? Did he bring everything he needed to bring? No, did he fuck? <laughs> no chance. He um, he brought enough to catch carp, obviously, and somehow he always um, he always seems to bring. He, he always seems to not bring something, but always make do somehow. So. What about food? I know he's not, he's not the best with uh, bringing his own food, is he? Well, he eats everything and anything, so it doesn't really matter about food. I think he's, um, he will, f again, he just, he will find food somehow, even if it's um, a few grains of rice, he will eat anything. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, he got food, he, he done all right for his food. All right, so less about Finn. So, as we've already alluded to, the fact that you stay turned into be a pretty good decision made by yourself. So do you want to run us through kind of what happened in the moments after the boys left? Yeah, yeah. Um, we was actually 
We was actually at a spot that we kept going back to where we see carp spawning um, in the f first moments of, of arriving in, in Belgium. And they left and I did feel like a little bit um, deflated, you know, I felt a little bit alone, but um, I knew what I had to do. So I just went down to some spots that we'd fished during the week, put a little bait in on a few spots, checked around. Um, I was very tired, so I went back to where I had had a bite. One day during the week, I, I got a bite, but it did, nothing was on there. Um, so I thought I'd go back to that spot, um, set up and have a little rest and, and chill out for a bit after putting some bait in. Um, got back to that spot, got the rods out, fell asleep. The alarm started going and one toner. So I've looked out, I was actually in the van, sitting in the van, at like sleep in my van, which is quite close to the rods. Um, and the net was right against the van and I had one rod 100 yards down the bank and one rod in front of me. And as I've looked out, there was two kids spinning and I thought the kids had just caught up with a line and, and just literally, I thought it was like, oh, for fuck's sake. You know, I thought I'm gonna have to go out there, pull the rod and redo it. Um, walk down there slowly, pick the rod up and then realized it wasn't the kids. They were still winding in, so I was like, oh. Started playing something that felt heavy and it was really close into the margin and it come up pretty quick. And it was uh, the biggest flank of common I've, I've had on my line. Um, and I've looked for the net and I was like, shit, the fucking net's at the van. It was like 20 yards away, you know? Um, and the, the bank down to, to the canal was really steep at this, at this spot where I was fishing. So I literally just had to loosen the drag off, put the rod on the buzzer, run back to the van, grab the net, um, got the rod back in hand, slid down the bank on my ass into the water and yeah, netted this 50 pound, 52 pound, 13, I think it was, um, common. And these two lads come running around and they was like, buzz. it was just such a big buzz, you know? Then like the little bank where the, where the slope went down, I think you've got footage of it somewhere, where the slope went down, there was like a tiny little edge and I was like trying to walk along this edge with this fucking 52 pound common in it, um, all the way to a little like stop bit where I could get out of the water and do photos and weigh-ins and stuff. History was made for me, really, you know, it was my, um, well, the highlight of my fishing, you know. Yeah, and these two lads was there, they were young lads, and they was like, you've got footage somewhere, I've, I've, you'll have to obviously put it on, but yeah, it's, um, it was like buzzing, and it was just such a big buzz, you know, and it was such a shame that the boys had just left, it was like hours, like, I phoned them, they were still in France, I hadn't even got out of, um, out of, the, out of Europe, um, and it was like, just minutes, like a few hours before and the boys would have been there and the cameras would have been there and obviously it would have been um, a lot more on video, but the moment, yeah, the moment for me was um, incredible, you know, yeah, it was uh, like a Belgian dream really, something that I've been wanting to accomplish for a few years and yeah, it was, yeah hopefully I'll go back and try and um, do it again sometime soon. Been running around all day looking for fish as we have been all week. Um, come to this little spot where well, me and Tom fished here. Well, we all fished on this stretch during the week. Um, and me and Tom had a little go in this spot. Um, and I lost one. Um, but we didn't really see what it was, but it did feel quite heavy when it sort of took off. So I thought I'd come back here on the back of that because I didn't really have a lot else to go on. Um, and I've just slipped a 52 pound 12 common underneath the net. Oh! <laughs> And it feels, oh my God, look at that. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Everyone. Epic moment, lads. Epic moment. <laughs> Two lads spinning opposite me. Come over to give me some help. Look at what we got. £52.12. Oh my God, look at that. In my wildest dreams of 52 pound 12 from the canals, the public waters into Belgium. What a fish. Ready? Look at the flank on that. Look at the flank on that. And it's gone. Next question regarding Jim Shelley's Hunter Uncut series. Now, Jim was probably one of the first people to do a YouTube vlog way back in the day, you know, certainly in carp fishing, not ever. Um, but that vlog that he used to do, uh, we now have it on topography, and Jim's fishing nowadays is pretty much all abroad. But 
that would be if you're looking at his personal fishing, as we call it. You know, he still does a lot of fishing in the UK. He goes to places all the time with his tuitions, etc. And we also feature that within the vlog. So the film that you know, the films we get from him for the uncut series are quite varied. And this one is a good example of that. You know, he starts at Swan Valley, which is a day ticket in Yateley, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with, maybe have even been there fishing yourself. It's a great venue. If you haven't been there, I would recommend it. And the other half of the vlog is abroad, where Jim spends most of his time fishing now, if he can. And the main reason Jim has gone out there is because it's, you know, it's a whole new lease of life. I've spent a long time fishing in this country, but you never know what you're going to get abroad because there's so much water. The places are so vast. You know, you, you couldn't fish every venue in Europe, you know, if you went somewhere different every two days for the rest of your life. You know, there is that much water out there. And the carp that I'm going to show you here, I just want to show you it because it's such a nice carp and it's a prime example of the hidden gems that can quite literally just pop up out of nowhere whilst you're doing this kind of fishing. You know, an incredible fish. And my question to you is how many of you have been watching Jim's Hunter Uncut vlogs on Sopography. I'm sure people watching this are Sopography members and it'd be nice to know if you've been watching them, do you enjoy them? Uh, I think they're great. They really are. You know, he puts a lot of effort into them. You get such a good insight into Jim's fishing and there's loads of them. You know, he produces hours and hours of vlog content every year. So, yeah, have you been watching Jim's content? Do you enjoy it? And, you know, this is a little taster of what to expect from it. Nothing, nothing. Couple of spots, um, but no points in the cup. Just got to keep looking. Done. Has to speak. Well, the best spot on the other stretch. Um, that's where I salted them a month ago. Big blocks. It's glowing down there. So now some bait on it, salty juice, done. I think the camera can pick this up, it's a nice little uh, gravel around here just off the margin and it's like turn, nice, and it's along the other, or across the other side, let's put it uh, there, so it's this side, the subtle swims. It's just overgrown for miles like that, basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bucket, half a bucket, um, a mixed particle, like hemp slash tiger, oilies, and some pellets. And this will be where I can come and stalk. Might just hang around for a little bit because when you look at the gravel, it's just it's clean for a reason. Carp love man made objects, structure, blah blah blah. Even if it's plastic staging, metal posts, concrete, metal, and they love a flipping bridge. I ain't going to fish here tonight. Just can't believe I haven't found one. Unreal, and it's like only 22, 23 degrees. Don't know what the air pressure is, but for July, this is like good conditions. So I'm going to fish further down past this lock. We're at a 35 last trip. I need to check out one more zone and bait that if I don't stay there and go right to 35. always fish by like maggot drowners, pleasure anglers. So it always gets traffic mopping stuff up. And then I'm gonna go where I baited them canals earlier. I'm just gonna put boilies in there because I can see them. I'm gonna put big ones in. 18s and 22 millers. Just in a tench go past. No carp. It's about I think it's about 20 to 5 um, French time. It's Sunday. I really, within the next two hours, 
I really want to be at a swing getting my rods out, to be fair. I've been up since um, quarter past three. So I've done what I needed to do. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put some boilies in here. Let's go and get this sorted. Boys, got me into these. Peppers. Forget about the red one, that's just a normal pepper. But I like them. But these other ones, oh, they're lovely. So I'm going to have a ribeye steak, mushroom, and um, asparagus. Just getting these done first. Yeah. Careful, dude. Rods are out. There's number four. And under the bridge, there's another three. Nice. I've been smashing these already. These are lovely. Savage. I was that knackered. I couldn't film what I was doing. I was just too focused to get my rods out and get some food inside me and then chill out. It's been a long, long day. Nice. Elliot just went, I bet you're pissed off with the weed. I said, no. Traps are set, four as well, perfect. I dropped Nashy back lids straight off the rod tips. Even though I've got rods up where that weed is about 90 yards from here. Got a nice mirror from the French Canal, 42 pounds. Bungee rig over Nashi. Oily hemp, slush tiger. Bit of mixed particle. And of course, ACP baits, Pacific Plum. Let's have a look. Really lively. Nice dark one. Happy days. And you've been here a night. Well, the rods have been out a night. Six ounce ball lead, right in the edge. Right. Shower here, soaked in a stinker carp. But who cares? Head on it. What a nice fish. Happy days. People are going to work and I'm working myself. Right, let's get it back. Right, last but not least, John. Timmermans. Now, we discovered John Timmermans on YouTube, and I'm sure lots of you have seen his videos as well. He's been making them for a long time. John was one of the first people to start travelling into Europe. And in fact, this month, or this sort of collection of films that I've been speaking about are quite Eurocentric. You know, that month we put out a lot of stuff from Europe. And there's a good reason for that, you know. We tend to try to lean you know, far more towards English content because we get the impression a lot of people in the UK prefer that. You know, you'd rather see stuff that is more relatable to what you do here at home. But, you know, there is so much to be seen, so many carp to be caught, and you know, so much fun to be had in Europe that we, we, always, you know, we always include a bit of that. And it just so happens that this month there was quite a bit of that. You had Finn going abroad, you've got Jim's vlog, and then now you've got this John Timmermans film. But John has been making films in Europe since you know day dot way before anyone else really he's been everywhere and he's been really popular with the people on youtube and it was because of that we thought we'd love to have him on topography so john timmermans now does two or three films a year exclusively for topography so if you've been used to watching some of his stuff on youtube and you like it you know maybe check these films out as well because i'm sure you'll love them and this next clip i would say just epitomizes john you know, he's a very accomplished angler. He's been all over the place. He's a pioneer. You know, he goes to places that people haven't told him to go to, you know. Finds his own lakes, goes on his own adventures, and certainly has a, 
have a, has a few hiccups and stuff along the way, you know. It's, it's raw, it's rugged, it's very relatable, I'm sure. And, you know, John never claims to be a, a pro. He doesn't come across like that. You know, he's quite clumsy at times. And, but that is what makes him so enjoyable to watch because he is a very, very good angler at heart. And he's also a guy that goes fishing with his family. He doesn't get loads of time, but, but often the videos he makes are whilst he's fishing with his family. And this clip is of an incredible carp that he caught whilst on holiday with his missus and the kids. And what a fish it is. So check this out. A great way to end this month's Talking Points video. So like I say, Put your comments in the comments section, answer the questions we've asked you and one of you will get given a hoodie as a little thank you for getting involved. And of course, if there's other questions you want to ask us, you can use your comments section to do that as well. So check this clip out from John Timmermans. And my, fi my final question to you is, have you ever seen anything like this? Okay, it's first light on Saturday morning, so we've been here a week now. Um, and last night, last night was the first night that we did. We've been baiting them. Oh, we're away, we're away. Another big fish. Oh, amazing. It's amazing. It, we've got another good mirror. I can't actually believe that. I was just going to give you the rundown of what's been going on. My first night on the lake, after a week of looking, not finding any, so it's kind of a process of elimination. Finally, we find them. We gave it a good baiting of tiger nuts, 
Scopex squid, strawberry and pineapple bait um, two days ago, probably put about 20 kilo in. We've left it, yet. Yeah, we've left it 36 to 48 hours. And we've come back, we've got a brace of 20 kilos. 6,800 acres of water. A, bra a brace of 20 kilo glacial carp on the first night. Oh my God, that is what dreams are made of. So, um, neither, these are very, These are very old carp. Um, oh my good God. Very old carp. Um, this is like a, almost a true leather. Um, they're old fish, they're like relics. Um, absolutely amazing, massive mouth. Um, and you saw that take. It's, been baiting in four meters of water, three three to five meters, to be fair, before it drops off. And that's where we've had him from. Oh, amazing, absolutely amazing. Can't believe it, trip made. And we've still got a few nights, Not we won't fish for a few more nights, we'll bait heavily. My mum arrives, we'll do the family thing, and then we'll be back down, fingers crossed. Okay. Let's turn you around. God, he's got loads of scars on him, this fish. But he's absolutely ancient. Absolutely ancient. You'll, you'll see from the fight, I had the GoPro on. Um, he literally, he came straight back towards me, buried himself in the weed. And then, okay. So yeah, for the record, that's 45.5 pounds. Not too relevant really, when you've got fish like that. Well, we'll call him a true leather. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Just to give you a feel for, this is quite a plump fish. It's got a good bit of weight to that stomach. Wonderful, right, okay. Oh, 